Good evening and welcome to CPI Talks. My name is Ashoka. I'm the Executive Director of Waterloo Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute, CPI. And as those of you who have been in CPI Talks before already know, CPI Talks is CPI's uh, public outreach lecture series. Uh, the intended audience for CPA Talks is the general public, so we don't assume any prior knowledge of or expertise in cybersecurity or privacy. And in particular, we welcome high school students and undergraduate students. Uh, CPA Talk lectures are delivered by uh, world-leading experts, both from CPI uh, and from our colleagues uh, around the world. Uh, and the idea is to explain important uh, cybersecurity and privacy issues to the public at large. And our speakers are not only well-known experts and role models, but also role models. And our hope is that some of the, uh, uh, some of you among the audience who are students will be inspired by the topics and the speakers to consider specializing in cybersecurity and privacy yourselves. Um, so before we uh, start the, um, um, the uh, uh, before I introduce the speaker for today, um, let us start with the traditional uh, territorial acknowledgement. Um, uh, many of us who work at the University of Waterloo uh, live and work in the territory of uh, uh, the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is uh, located on Haldimand Tract, the land granted to the six nations that includes uh, six miles on each side of the uh, Grand River. Um, uh, many of you are uh, joining from different places in the world, so I invite all of you in your own way to think about the, uh, the land um, that you live and work on and, uh, and uh, uh, acknowledge it accordingly. Um, so today it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Sini Kamara. Uh, he's an associate professor in computer science at Brown University, where he co-directs uh, the Encrypt Systems Lab. Uh, he's a well-known cryptographer who started his career uh, in the industry at Microsoft Research. Um, uh, his research uh, um, um, initially, his, his research even now focuses on using cryptography to address uh, real-world problems. Uh, early on, he did a lot of work, uh, pioneering work on um, encrypted search. And recently has also been focusing on the social impacts of technology. And I believe uh, today's talk uh, touches on, on this aspect. So join me in welcoming uh, Sani. Sani. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, and also thank you for, uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to give a, to give a talk in this, uh, in this great series. So the title of my talk is Crypto for the People, and this is part two because it's a continuation of a talk uh, that I gave at a conference called Crypto in 2020. And so uh, what that talk was about, it was about, um, well, it was motivated um, by uh, the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. And in that talk, um, I made, or I tried to make several arguments um, different points, but one of the main points that I was trying to make is that while it was clear to me that um, corporations and governments and venture capitalists benefit from the work that we do in cryptography, what was less obvious to me um, was whether regular people benefit from our work and research in crypto, and in particular, whether marginalized groups benefit from um, from what we do in cryptography. And so this was sort of the high level point that, that I tried to make. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you know, I, um, I encourage you to watch the talk. It's on, uh, it's on YouTube. And so in during this talk, I, I try to, ex or I try to give, um, examples of work in cryptography that I felt, uh, address the needs of marginalized groups. But I also thought it would be important to include a slide on what I didn't think addressed uh, the needs of marginalized groups. And as an example, um, so I had this slide and I gave an example uh, that went something like, you know, a project that claims, you know, like a blockchain project that claims that it's gonna serve rural communities in Africa and that it's gonna solve longstanding developmental issues and unlock much needed economic growth is not the kind of project that I had in mind, right? 
Um, so this was an example of what not to do, right? Or what I at least would not consider um, crypto for the people. And this is a real example. Um, and so I gave the talk and um, I got a lot of feedback. I got a lot of email, um, a lot of really positive and, and um, interesting email and a lot of interesting things have come out of that. Um, but I also got, um, you know, several emails that really puzzled me. And one of them uh, was an email by somebody that was trying to explain to me how blockchain could uh, solve or help with the problem of police violence. Um, and this really, really puzzled me because it was basically, I mean, it's, it's effectively, you know, almost exactly what I said I didn't want to hear about, right? And so I kept wondering, like, why am I getting these emails? Like, this is, you know, I, I had a whole slide in my talk uh, that tried to, uh, to address this already. Um, and, you know, and sort of the reason this happens um, is, is because of the way that a lot of us are uh, are educated in a way that a lot of us think, right? And so it's not, maybe it's not so surprising that I would get this kind of email because basically what happens is the following, right? So think of your favorite cryptographer, Bob, okay? So Bob likes fancy cryptography. So things like blockchain and encrypted search, which is the area that, that I work in, um, indistinguishably obfuscation, fully homomorphic encryption, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then Bob notices that people are talking about police violence and like sexual assault and bias and discrimination, misinformation. And so Bob puts two and two together and thinks, oh, I know what I'll do, right? I'll use cryptography to solve police violence. So I'll use cryptography to solve whatever social problem. Um, and so, okay, why is this a problem, right? Or, or you know, um, what is the issue here? So the problem in my mind is that Bob is not really interested in the social problem. Right. What Bob is really interested in is in the crypto problem that Bob claims is motivated by the social problem. Right. And so while the crypto problem itself is it's fun and intellectually interesting, it doesn't necessarily address the real problem at hand. Right. And so essentially, Bob has a hammer and Bob is looking for a social nail. Right. That's that's essentially what's going on. And of course, like individuals are not the only ones that do this. Um, corporations do it all the time, right? And so this is the homepage of uh, the DM project. So DM is the, you know, some uh, version of Facebook or Meta's cryptocurrency. Um, and, and so this is the front page. And, 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 you know, this woman here on the front page is presumably from West Africa. And um, my family's from West Africa. And, um, you know, I never realized that Facebook or Meta was so interested in West Africa, right, in, in, in its culture and in, in its economies um, and in its people. And of course, I think most of us can see through this, right? Most of us understand that uh, DM or Libra or whatever the, you know, the name of the cryptocurrency is, wasn't created initially to address the problems of people in West Africa, right? That wasn't that probably was not the original reason. But what happens is that, you know, using marginalized groups, or in this case, use, using developing nations, is a great way to look sincere and to look altruistic, right? When you're trying to, to develop something or when you're trying to push something that people don't want, right? And so what's really happening both with Bob, and in this case with, um, with Facebook, is that marginalized groups are being used as branding, right? Um, so it, it's great to want to address social problems. Um, you know, that's something that I would encourage. But oftentimes, what's really happening is just that, right? The the social problem is used as a branding opportunity, right? And this is why we get narratives in in you know in the tech space like cryptocurrencies for developing countries. Um, fintech for the unbanked and AI teachers and chatbots for poor and underserved areas, right? And this is the, this last one is a real example of a project. So the idea is that you know in rural areas, um, you know, let's educate people by chatbot, right? Instead of just having them educated by teachers, right? Um, and so, okay, so so what should we do, right? What should Bob do if Bob really cares about a social problem and wants to? to try and, um, and work on it. 
So at least from my perspective, the first thing that Bob should do is that Bob should really work with experts, okay? And this means experts in the social sciences and the humanities, people with expertise on the particular problem uh, that is being considered. Um, and Bob should also work with people uh, that are experts because of their lived experience, right? People who have actually gone, you know, who have actually experienced this problem, right? In their lives. And lived experience is really important because um, oftentimes the details really, really matter and the details are very, very hard to, to know about, right? So if any of you have ever been through some kind of traumatic experience, right? What you probably noticed is that some of the, um, the most difficult aspects of that experience are these little details that you wouldn't have predicted, right? That you wouldn't know of unless you've actually experienced that thing, right? Um, and so these things are really, really important. Right. Um, the psychological state really, really matters, right, of the people that are being impacted by these problems. And the broader context around it, of course, is very important as well. Right. So these are just some of the reasons why people's lived experiences really have to be taken into account. Um, so essentially, you know, if Bob wants to work on these problems, then Bob should collaborate, right? Bob should collaborate with experts because they're the ones that know which assumptions make sense and which assumptions don't make sense, right? They're the ones uh, that know the real practical constraints around the problem. They understand the psychological and the human dimensions of the problem. Um, also, they know which risks are going to be tolerable and which, which risks are not, right? And they can, also, they can also see potential harms that you may not be able to see, okay? Um, so this is really important. Um, and so essentially, you know, and, and or in addition, I should say, Bob, you know, should, um, you know, so as, as technologists, we, we get excited about technology and we want to produce technological solutions to, to everything. This is how we're trained. Um, but really, Bob should be open to designing technology, even technology that is boring, right, as long as it's useful, right? The goal here is to produce something that is useful to the people who are experts on this problem, right? Um, so that should come before the technology itself. So in the rest of the talk, I wanna give uh, some examples of projects, uh, some of which were done at Brown and um, some of which weren't that, that, I, that I think capture this, this, uh, this spirit and this, uh, this way of working. So the first project, um, was related to, uh, to gun control in the US. And so this was a, uh, a project uh, with uh, my PhD student, Lucy Shen, uh, my collaborator, Tariq Moataz, um, and Andrew Park, uh, who was um, a master's student at Brown and who is now doing his PhD at uh, CMU. And um, yeah, so this was a project around gun violence. And so um, gun violence, so basically 36, thousand uh, Americans are killed every year and hundred thousands are injured by guns. Um, 600 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner every year. Four and a half million women are threatened with a gun every year. Black people are 10 times more likely to be killed uh, with a gun than whites and black men account for 52% of gun deaths. And of course, gun violence is a huge problem in the US, uh, but it's also a big problem in, in a lot of other countries. Um, and as we, as we all know, um, gun violence and mass shootings in particular are happening everywhere. Um, movie theaters, nightclubs, elementary schools, grocery stores. Um, and as we saw uh, yesterday in the subway in Brooklyn um, as well, right? So, um, so this, is a real, this is a real epidemic. And the, the the gun problem, the gun violence problem in the US is a really, really complicated one. Um, one that I can't really summarize in a talk. And um, it, it hits on many different things, right? There's, there's a cultural component to it. Uh, there's, there's different policy aspects to it. Um, but one of the things that makes it very complicated is uh, the set of, of gun control laws in the US. Um, and I'm not going to go over them, um, but I will uh, just point out one, which is the, Fire, the Firearm Owner Protection Act of 1986, um, which effectively bans the federal government um, from requiring 
um, gun registration, right, from forcing gun registration in the US. And so, um, and so the way this project started is that in uh, 2019, um, Senator Wyden, who's uh, one of the senators from Oregon, Senator Wyden's staff uh, reached out to us and told us about a, a bill that they were drafting. And this bill, the idea was that um, it, was, it was a bill that they were designing in order to create a voluntary, um, a voluntary system that would be roughly equivalent in terms of, um, of, of effect to a national gun registry without necessarily being officially a gun registry, okay? So there's a lot of legal design in this bill uh, to craft something that, uh, that would still be, you know, uh, that, that wouldn't violate the, the gun control laws in the US, but would give law enforcement something, an approximation of a national gun registry, if you will. And um, as they were designing this bill, there were a lot of privacy questions that came up. And what they wanted to know was whether it was possible to use cryptography to design um, a, uh, a system of locally managed databases that would be end-to-end -end encrypted um, in such a way that the, the, these local databases would be controlled by local officials. So very like hyper-local, like county officials, for example, um, and they would be encrypted in such a way that nobody could ever see the data, right? The, in particular, the federal government could never see the data, state government could never see the data, but law enforcement would still be able to query over this encrypted data and get back only the records that it's querying for, okay? Um, and there were a bunch of different requirements that they had um, in order to meet their, their legal, this sort of their legal design. Um, and they just wanted to know whether this was possible or not, because nothing like this had ever been designed. Um, and so, you know, so we so we took on uh, so so you know we 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 read the bill and we tried to you know we we worked with them to try and understand uh, what they needed, and uh, we spent um, a year and a half or two years basically working on this. So we we designed a cryptographic protocol to address uh, the variety of different constraints that they had. Um, and we, um, and then we built a prototype. And so here, the, the two lines that I highlighted in red are, these are examples of things that um, us as cryptographers, we never would have known um, by ourselves, right? These are very, very specific things that the Senator's staff put in the bill because of, you know, because of the legal constraints, right? We, we never would have guessed that these constraints were important, right? Um, so, uh, so we published the, the, a paper that describes uh, the, the cryptographic protocol behind the system and, and the system itself. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with the details of the cryptography. If you're interested, um, you, can, you can read the paper. Um, but but after we designed the protocol, we so we 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 as I mentioned, we built uh, a prototype, and um, and we tried to see if we could run it at scale. Right, this was one of the questions that they had. Um, once we told them that we could design something, they were like, "Well, would it actually run right at the scale of the U.S.?" Um, and so we did some experiments, and we found that you know uh, we could handle 400 million records with the largest county holding 50 million records. Um, it would take 300 uh, milliseconds to identify the county that a gun is in, and at most uh, one minute to query uh, an end-to-end -end encrypted local database, right? the one that is relevant to that particular gun. Um, it takes about 45 minutes to add 10,000 records um, to the system, and we estimated that if, if this was running in the cloud, uh, it would take about, or it would cost about a hundred thousand a year, right? This was another question that they had: was you know how much would it cost to to uh, to run this? And notice here that I said that we could run it in the cloud, and the reason why it actually could be run in the cloud is because it's end-to-end -end encrypted, so nothing ever gets decrypted, right? Um, except at the at the endpoint of the law enforce uh, the law enforcement agent that gets back the specific record that it's looking for, right? Um, so whether it's in the cloud or whether it's on a private system, it doesn't it really doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so a few things I wanted to highlight about this project is that 
Um, this was really a collaboration between our team and the senator's team. Uh, they're the ones that designed, that, that really designed um, the, the, the bill and, and gave us the constraints, right? We did everything based on their legislation. Um, our role was really to work and to make sure that the constraints, you know, were uh, were satisfied, and we really prioritized their needs, right? We were kind of in a, you know, we designed the cryptography, but we viewed our role as a almost like a support role, right? It's like you tell us what you need, and then we'll try and achieve it, and then we went back to them, um, told them what kind of assumptions we had to make in order to make the design work, asked them if that was okay, and they would tell us like, no, this is not going to be okay, or yes, this is going to be okay, right? It was this very, like, iterative kind of workflow. Um, yeah, so that's how the project uh, went. Um, but there were some challenges. And in particular, one challenge was incentives. And this is something that is going to happen whenever you're doing work um, of this type. So for one, there was no funding for this project, right? Um, and this was a relatively large team, you know, as, as far as academic teams go. So there was one associate professor, which was myself. Uh, there was a postdoc, a PhD student, and two master's students. And it took about, about two years. Um, but of course, you know, senators don't have funding for research, right? Um, and, and it would have taken too long to try and get funding from the National Science Foundation. It's not something that was really, that was really an option. Um, and some of you may not know, I'm not exactly sure how it is in Canada, but in the US, we only get, uh, professors only get paid for nine months out of 12 years, right? Uh, sorry, out of 12 months. For the remaining few months, we have to get, um, we have to, we have to uh, pay ourselves our salary from grants. Um, and grants is also how we, uh, how we fund our PhD students, uh, postdocs, um, et cetera, okay? So you can see that if there's no funding attached to this kind of work, right, to work that is, uh, you know, of this nature, it can be very challenging, right? Like there's going to have to be sacrifices that everybody is going to have to make. Um, and of course, when we look at the different funding, the different types of funding sources available, so I mentioned the NSF and why that was, you know, that wasn't really an option. Other types of funding that we have in the U.S. for research are DARPA and IARPA. These are the funding agencies of the defense um, uh, uh, of the Defense Department, um, but this is really, you know, their funding is really focused on government and military needs, right? Um, the other option that people have is funding from industry, but of course, industry funding is tied to industry trends and, and things that industry cares about, right? This is not something that um, industry would be particularly interested in. Um, so another challenge in, in doing this project is that we, we knew right away, we knew early on um, that the odds that our protocol and our prototype and our system would ever be used in real life were basically like, you know, close to zero, right? I mean, and this is because the idea of a national gun registry in the US, it's a political third rail. It's something that just, um, you know, creates, a, it stirs up a lot of emotion on both sides, and it's really a problem that is that is almost intractable from a policy point of view. Um, you know, we understood right away that the legislation might never actually come out, right? It still hasn't um, come out yet. And we also knew that the timing uh, would be subject to the political landscape, right? And in particular, at the time where we were working on it, um, you know, we were also asked to, to keep uh, our results or, you know, to, to delay talking about our results for some time because of the U.S. election, right, which, which makes sense. I mean, um, you know, so we have to be sensitive to, you know, to, to the political landscape, basically, right. Um, and, you know, we also, and so, so what this means is that we understood, right, that there would likely be no opportunity to claim real world impact, right, for this work. And, you know, the ability, or at least for people who, you know, like me, who, tend to work on, on uh, crypto problems that are motivated from real world problems, um, you know, the ability to claim real world impact is important, right? It helps your tenure case and it helps for future funding as well, right? But this is something that we knew wouldn't really, or would be very unlikely in this, in this scenario. Um, so basically we knew, or we, you know, we were conscious that our work would very likely have no industry impact, right? It would have no financial impact. 
Um, and it would be very unlikely to have any practical or real world impact, right? And so you may ask like, so, you know, why did you spend two years of your life um, working on this? Um, you know, and the reason is because what we hoped is that maybe it would have some form of policy impact, right? So gun violence is one of the most important social problems in the US. Gun control is one of the most intractable policy problems in the US. And the privacy of gun owners is part of the debate, right? It, it's part of the argument um, that both sides are, are making. Um, and so we hope that maybe by addressing this privacy problem, right, which is just one small component of this, this huge problem, that maybe, um, you know, our work could help at least remove this concern, right? And, and sort of change the debate at least a little bit so that we could say, well, okay, privacy itself isn't necessarily as big of an issue anymore, right? Let's focus on the other, uh, the, the, the set of other big problems related to, uh, to gun violence, or sorry, related to, uh, uh, to, to, to the problem of a national gun registry. So, so this, is, this is what we hoped. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll have to see, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, so another project that I wanted to mention, this was not a project that, uh, that was done at Brown. It was a, a project that was done in the UK, uh, in particular at Royal Holloway. And this is a collaboration, uh, between, uh, the two folks on the slide, um, Rika Jensen and Martin Albrecht. And this is a really interesting collaboration um, in my mind uh, because they're both coming from very, very different worlds. And so as an example, I just gave uh, the last or you know, the latest papers uh, that each one has written. Uh, so Rika's, Rika's paper or one of her last paper was Active Agency, um, Access and Power. And with Mar one of Martin's um, latest papers was subtractive sets or recyclotomic rings, limits of Schnorr-like arguments over lattices, right? So what you can see right away is that these are, you know, they're coming from very different worlds, right? Um, and so this is a fascinating collaboration, right? So like one is uh, an ethnographer and the other is a cryptographer and a particular mathematical cryptographer. And it turns out that they, they work kind of in the same place at Royal Holloway and they started talking um, and they found that they actually had a lot of interest in common, even though they were coming from these complete like polar opposite um, worlds. And one of the things that they decided uh, to do was to study uh, the, or do an ethnographic study of um, privacy during uh, the Hong Kong protests. And, and this is a really fascinating paper. I, you know, I recommend uh, if you're interested in this to, to definitely check out their work. So as context, um, uh, in 2019, uh, the government proposed a bill to change uh, the extra, extradition laws in Hong Kong. And this was seen to give China the ability to quash dissent, okay? And so um, protests started on March 19th and these protests kind of escalated uh, with time, basically due to police misconduct, um, and also because emergency powers were invoked. Um, and so this team from Royal Holloway uh, conducted structured interviews of people who participated in these protests. Um, there were seven, um, seven people who had frontline experience and four with secondary experience. Um, and they were interested in understanding how, uh, you know, how folks um, thought about privacy and in particular about the, the privacy technologies that they were using. Um, and so they found a lot of interesting things, right? So one of them was that Telegram was preferred to Signal. So if you ask most cryptographers, they would recommend Signal. And this is for very valid reasons. Um, but still, uh, a lot of protesters preferred Signal. And one of the reasons was because um, Telegram didn't require a phone number, you know, and so this mattered in people's decision making. Um, they also asked about how people felt about anti encryption and confidentiality. Um, and what they found is that usually 
people used or really cared about end-to-end -end encryption when they were communicating with a small close-knit group. But when they were uh, like larger scale communications, so happening uh, among much larger groups, then end-to-end -end encryption um, was less important. And in particular, what, they, uh, what people really cared about was anonymity, right? They wanted to be able to post uh, anonymously um, and, and communicate with these, with these large groups. Um, they also found that one of the things that was really, really important was uh, collective security. And in particular, this means that this meant that um, folks weren't only concerned about their individual security and individual privacy, they were also really concerned about the group's collective privacy and security. And in particular, um, if for, or for example, if one person is arrested, right, then how does that affect the rest of the group? Right. What kind of security mechanisms are in place in order to make sure that the whole group isn't affected by this, right? Or, or the damage is, uh, is minimized. Um, another interesting finding is that um, trusted third parties were not necessarily a deal breaker. So, you know, if you, if you study cryptography long enough, uh, you'll, you'll see that um, cryptographers have this kind of aversion to trusted third parties. A lot of work in cryptography is, um, is done to get rid of trusted third parties, that we don't have to trust anybody, right? And it turns out that um, at least in, in, the, in the Hong Kong protest, this was not necessarily an issue. And the protesters actually used trusted third parties quite a bit. Um, and in particular, they had certain, uh, certain, certain individuals that they called, or that in the paper are called connective leaders, that were basically used um, kind of as group administrators to, um, to, to, uh, to help organize different, different actions and coordinate between, between people. And, and people were perfectly comfortable with this. Um, so another paper that I just wanted to mention, so this was a paper that was written um, by my PhD student, Leah Rosenblum at Brown. And so, what Leah did is, so Leah was, um, so she's a, you know, she's a PhD student in, in cryptography. She's also uh, a teacher and she's also an activist as well. Um, and during the protest in 2020, she was um, active in the protest and she ended up interviewing 50 Black Lives Matter activists. Um, this was sort of, she just had the opportunity to do it. So she just decided to just, you know, um, to just, do a quick survey and 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 interview them. Um, you know, and there's there's a lot of interesting findings in this paper as well. Um, you know, so one of the things that she wanted to know was, you know, how easy is it for you to find the information that you're looking for, right? Um, and she found that 66 percent of the people that she interviewed, you know, said that basically um, the way that they got information that they trusted and that they actually acted upon was really um, from close-knit groups, right? People that they knew, um, um, that they knew physically, right? Rather than online, right? And this kind of makes sense um, intuitively. And she also asked them about, uh, you know, what, what they thought about different uh, organizing tools, in particular digital, um, and so what people, you know, what people were concerned with was, of course, encryption and privacy, but also there was, you know, they were also very concerned about the corporate ownership of uh, these communication tools of messengers and, 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 uh, and other ways to communicate. And again, we see here some common threads were the community, the community or group based privacy and security, right, which is not really something that cryptographers uh, tend to study much, right. Um, and so based on these findings, so, so she did this study, um, and then based on these findings, she's now using these findings to design a communication system for activists, right? Uh, that she's been working on, um, or we've been working on together for, uh, for some time. But, but again, here, what I wanna highlight is that all of the, you know, and it's, it's a bit too early to talk about the details of the system, but all of the design decisions um, that she's taking in the design of the system are really informed by her own experience as an activist, but also by this study that she did, right? She's not just making things up, right? Making assumptions about what people care about. Um, 
Okay, so um, yeah, so that was some examples of um, uh, of projects that I thought were were interesting. And uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about, because I think it is related to this, is education. And um, basically, so you know, I think most, or you know, okay, I think most people would agree right now that there's a you know there's a technology backlash. Right, we we've seen this, um, especially with Silicon Valley, and I think you know what's happening is that technology and um, computer science has shifted. Right, there, there was a shift somewhere in the two thousands where computer science and technology went from being something that kind of affected people, but in a very indirect way to something that affects people in a very direct way, right? So as an example, back in the, you know, in the 90s, um, and maybe up to the very early 2000s, but, but I'd say more in the 90s is when I was educated, uh, computer science and technology was, was really like about productivity, right? This is what it was impacting, right? So you could, you know, word processors and, and spreadsheets and these kinds of things, right? Um, and as computer scientists, the way that we were educated, my generation of computer scientists and the ones before that, we were really educated or our thought process was that, okay, well, computer science is about machines, right? So you worked on compilers, right? Or you worked with, which has to do with programming languages, or you worked on operating systems, or you worked on databases, right? Um, but somewhere, somewhere in the 2000s, that started to change, right? We started seeing systems that were directly affecting people. Right. So as an example, just think of Google, right? Um, and 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 Google's ranking, right? Like the ranking that your business has on Google's web pages, that will affect your that will affect your livelihood, right? If you're highly ranked in Google search, right, you're probably gonna um, you know, your your business is probably gonna do better than if it's ranked very, very low, right? Um, and of course, we've seen this recently, we've seen a ton of cases recently, especially with machine learning where people are trying to use machine learning, right, to, to make decisions about bail, right, which affects, which is like literally affecting people's freedom, right? So this shift, so there's been this shift, right? And um, I don't think technology and computer science, and in particular, the way we educate computer scientists um, has shifted, right? With, or, or sort of has, has um, it hasn't evolved, right? So we're still educating computer scientists with this old framework, the old model, right? Where you're, where you you think of technology and you think of computer science as something that is about machines, right? Um, it hasn't evolved to 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 what it is today, which is a field that really is impacting people's lives, right? Um, and this is a problem, right? Because the traditional computer science education, um, it really like it, it values STEM over everything else, right? And it prizes technical prowess over critical thinking, right? And it really trains you, it exclusively trains you to solve quantitative problems. Like that's really what you're getting when you're getting a computer science education, right? You're becoming a really good technical problem solver, right? Um, but the problem is that social problems are not like the same as STEM problems, right? Social problems are not these well-posed, like very neat problems that have one optimal solution, right? Social problems can span many different fields. They may not have a solution, right? It may be something where you, you just have to find, you know, a trade-off, right? Um, they're, 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 they're sort of amorphous, right? They're fuzzy. They're not like, they're, they're more philosophical in nature, right? So the kind of training that, that CS education and STEM education gives you, it's not really tailored to address these social problems. Um, and, you know, and I think um, this is illustrated, right? Or, you know, like if, if, if you think of like the classical computer science student, right? The student that, um, that we put on a pedestal, right? This is the student that like comes into, you know, to, to an undergrad in computer science and 
takes like programming, operating systems and cryptography and, and complexity theory and all kinds of advanced math, uh, linear algebra and biology and chemistry, right? This is kind of like the typical computer science curriculum. It's filled with STEM, right? It's like 90% STEM, if not more. Um, and yeah, and I think this is, this is a problem, right? I think we have to evolve past this. Um, and in particular, what, what I would like to see is a, uh, a more modern kind of computer science student, right? A computer science student that is well-versed in, in STEM, right? Well-versed in math and in algorithms and, and systems and all of these things, but that is also well-versed in critical thinking, right? Has also received, um, you know, a strong education in the social sciences and in the humanities as well, right? And these are examples of um, courses at Brown that, and I'm sure there's similar courses, you know, um, pretty much everywhere, but these are courses that I think actually would make sense as part of a computer science education, right? Um, so things like ethnographic research methods or introduction to social psychology, methods of social research, history of capitalism, right? So like, uh, you know, we, we're producing undergraduate students and graduate students that are going off into industry, right? Um, that are building products, that are building companies, right? Like Silicon Valley was built by the students that we produce, right? Uh, it may be good that they understand capitalism, right? How it works and, and, um, uh, and the consequences of it, right? Um, classes like modern genocide, right? We, we, we know that Facebook played some part in uh, the genocide in Myanmar, right? Like maybe our students should have an understanding of how these, these events happen, right? What leads up to them. Um, another class is from Freud to QAnon, right? We, again, we know that social networks uh, played a huge role or play a huge role in, in, in spreading misinformation, right? Maybe this is something that our students should understand, right? So, so here, like, you know, I don't mean to suggest that um, computer science students are the ones that are going to be solving these problems. That is definitely not the case, right? I think at best, um, as computer scientists, we may play some small role in tackling these, these huge social problems. But what I would hope is that if we can educate our students um, more broadly, right, if we can provide them a, a really a broader education and equip them with different skill sets, and in particular, um, you know, equip them to, to understand and to, to really be able to reason about these social problems um, better, then maybe they can then use their technical skills to collaborate with people who are really experts on these problems um, better, right? And, and in these collaborations, maybe we'll have better technology, right? That, that, that will have less, or that will produce less harms, right? Um, so yeah, so that's my uh, you know my my hope on the on the education side, um, and yeah, that's um, yeah that's 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 it. That's that's what I had. Thank you, Zeni. Um, I think you you covered a, a broad spectrum. Uh, so for the audience, uh, if you have questions, you see the Q and A button, uh, uh, presumably at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can uh, uh, ask your questions there and uh, um, Zenny will be able to see it and answer uh, directly. Um, so please go ahead and ask your questions uh, via the Q&A button. Um, so maybe while the audience is uh, thinking of the questions to ask, perhaps I can ask something. So I, I, the, your, your last uh, part about education, uh, I think that resonated with me and, and many others who have been we're struggling with the same issues. So I'm sure you have encountered the same kind of opposition that when we say you have to broaden the education of computer science students, the counter argument is, okay, so what do you want computer science students to give up? Uh, which courses should they, that they are taking now that they should stop taking in, in, in order to make room for this? Do you have a, a thoughts on this? Like how do we balance this uh, so that they get the, the kind of experience that they were yeah. getting while being exposed to a broader kind of training? Yeah, no, it's a, yeah, I mean, it's an important question. It's, uh, it's a good question. So 
I think, I do think we tend to overestimate how important, you know, we are, how important our field is, right? And so I think what's gonna happen is if you ask, if you take a faculty, right? They're, as a whole, they're each gonna say, oh, well, every student should know, the cryptographers are gonna think every student should know some cryptography and every student, and then the database will every student should know something about databases, et cetera. And, you know, I, I'm not so sure that's true, right? Like, um, I, I don't think every student needs to know everything about computer science. I think if they do wanna, you know, if they want a really, really broad education in computer science, um, that's okay. They can they can opt. For, you know they should do that. Like I don't mean to suggest that everybody should you know needs to to sort of go down this path. Okay. So but let let me say first. Okay. So I think like um, there should be some social responsibility in all computer science curriculums. There should be some minimum amount there, right? But that I think we can fit without without students needing to give up on the rest of the STEM education. I think we can weave that into the classes we already have. Right, so that I think, okay. Now, the second thing is, I do think that um, for students that really wanna focus 100% or you know, 90% on, on computer science and STEM, I think they should still do that by weaving in the social responsibility across a lot of their classes, they'll still get that content. But then I do think that we should, we should give an opportunity to students who want a more balanced education, who are computer scientists, but want a more balanced education to receive that. Right. So one way that, um, for example, at Brown, uh, that I try to argue this or that I, that I try to explain this to students sometimes is that so we have a bachelor's of science and we have an AB. Right. So these are still they're both computer science degrees, but one of them has less requirements. Right. And this is a perfect vehicle for students that want a broader education to still get a, you know, a re like an incredibly strong computer science degree, they're still doing all of the core classes, right, in math and CS, et cetera. But then they don't necessarily need to take all of the advanced classes in all of the areas of computer science. They're taking advanced classes in, in a broad enough subset, right, that they want to focus on. And then they still have a lot of room left, you know, to go take classes in economics and in, in, in the humanities and in sociology and in ethnography, right? So. So that is a perfect way, I think, to sort of balance things out. Um, because again, I don't think everybody needs to know all of all of CS. And even within CS, people tend to specialize. So uh, no. exactly. So there is a question uh, in the Q and A. Um, are you able to see it, or do you want me to read it out, uh, Sunny? Uh, yeah, maybe if you could read it, I'll try and. Yeah, if you, I guess, if you stop sharing, then I think you should be able to see the Q and A okay. button. Um, so it's a question from Hadeep. He asks, uh, do you know any resources or organizations where I can be involved at the intersection of social sciences and technology? I'm very interested in the intersection, but I struggle to find communities with the same zest as me and, uh, and as, a, as a motive. Yeah, this is unfortunately, um, yeah, this is pretty common. I get emails, um, especially from students. I mean, I, I also get a lot of emails from faculty about this, but 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 a, a lot from students, and it's it is very difficult um, because again, it's not something that we've prioritized in our field, um, and so I think the people that have this this desire or that want to work on these problems are kind of very isolated and left alone. So there isn't really, you know, something formal. Um, what one thing that came out of uh, the first part of the talk that I gave at crypto is that I was talking to basically, there's a bunch of students that, you know, that emailed me with a similar question and I would, I would meet with them and I would talk with them. Um, and eventually um, with a few, with a few of these students, what we decided is to organize like a, um, uh, like a seminar that uh, we get together every, every few weeks and we talk about these issues. And so we have, we even have undergrad students as well in there. We have grad students, uh, some faculty also. Um, and so that's one thing, um, and I'd be happy to, um, to send you, uh, I can send you the link uh, to the webpage and, and um, or you can email me, anybody who's interested can just email me. My email is uh, seni at brown.edu, so S-E-N-Y, S-E-N-Y at brown.edu, and I can send you the information. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, what we're trying to do at Brown is we're trying, we're, we're building um, a center uh, 
that focuses on these on these questions at the intersection of, of CS and technology um, and social responsibility. So it's uh, myself and Suresh uh, Makata Subramanian, who's done a lot of work in algorithmic fairness. Um, and so we're we're trying to establish this uh, this this center basically that will focus on this stuff. And so, you know, if we're um, if we're successful, then hopefully we'll be able to have more formal events, you know, more a more formal space for for these types of interactions. Thanks. If, if there's anything that you want to share with the audience, any you can uh, send it to me, and we'll and when we uh, advertise your the video of uh, recording of this talk, we can also add this information. Uh, okay, in the great. same announcement. Uh, just I wanted to also follow up to have the, um, so at Waterloo, uh, there have been attempts at sort of uh, uh, grad level courses uh, that are cross-listed between computer science and, uh, and uh, sociology, for example, that touches on uh, both sides. So this is depending on uh, you know, where you are, that might be also of, uh, something of interest. And again, if you, if you don't find out, let, let uh, contact us at CPI and we can point you to the right people. Uh, there's a second question there. Um, um, uh, so it's from an anonymous attendee. Um, it says, um, you talked about the importance of collaboration between uh, computer scientists and people with expertise in other fields. Do you see this happening mainly through research or can startups and companies play a role in this too? Um, I mean, so I think the, you know, the question that I would ask is why is a company or a startup doing the project, right? Because, you know, companies are motivated by profit. That's what they do. That's, you know, that's what they are. Um, they may they may have perfectly good intentions, but at the end of the day, right, they have to make a profit. Um, that's what they do and that's their responsibility. And so, you know, and so, so for example, like I have a startup company, right? Like, and the goal, the goal of that company is to produce technology that I believe in, that I think will help everybody's privacy, right? This is based on technology that I've worked on for my entire career. Um, but I still recognize, I still understand that like in the form of a startup, in the form of a company, then at the end of the day, the decisions are going to be about money. That's the reality of it, right? If you have to make a trade-off between doing something, you know, for the greater good, right, and going under, right, um, your investors and your employees are going to want to make sure that you know you the company doesn't go under. So, so I think like we have to be honest about this, and we have to understand this, right? That that that's the nature of of companies. Um, the, the other thing that the, the other sort of blind spot, I think, with when you're doing this through a startup or through a company is that um, because, again, you're because, again, like the, the company has to make profit, right, it has to survive, then you're always going to be incentivized to work on problems that benefit um, a demographic, a, a group of people or, or, you know, that will pay for your technology. Right. Um, and the problem there is that what that what then happens or then the question is, what happens to the people who can't pay for your technology, who is addressing their needs? And this is kind of the point of my previous talk, right? The one at crypto is that us as as computer scientists and as cryptographers in academia, one of the points, one of the points that I tried to make as well in the talk was that we motivate our research as academics really by industry problems, right? Like using industry problems. Most of us, if we're honest and we actually sit down and think about it, those are the problems that we work on. It's problems that are given to us or problems that we think industry is going to struggle with, or let's say government or military is going to struggle with. And the question that I was trying to ask is, okay, well, what happens to everybody else that doesn't fit into that category? Who is, who is creating technology for them? Who is solving research problems for them, right? It's not clear that anybody is. And so again, if you're doing this work through your startup or through a company, I don't think that you're going to tackle those problems, right? You're unlikely to tackle the problems 
that are um, you know the the problems of people who who can't pay, right? Um, now that doesn't mean that you can't have a startup or work for a company and do work that benefits a lot of people through that, right? Like I said, I have a startup focused on privacy preserving technologies, and I think I really believe it's going to you know impact positively a lot of people. It's going to help improve people's privacy, but I also doing this work, this other work that is separate, right? That is in a different space and, and I consider them split, if that makes sense, because of these incentive, these incentive questions. So sorry, that was a little bit long-winded, but. Um, thanks, I think the next question is something that you touched on already. I'll, I'll read it anyway and you can uh, uh, see if you wanna add something. Do you have any recommendation of on any online courses related to this topic of social sciences and CS? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I mean, there's uh, there are a few courses that are um, on these topics. So I started a class uh, at Brown. It's called Algorithms for the People, um, and it had, the the first time I taught it, it had a different name. It was uh, Crypto for Social Good, and so in that class we talk about um yeah basically all of these issues so like you know we it's 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 a discussion base it's a discussion based class um and we cover things like uh, the genocide in Myanmar and and Facebook um we covered uh things like um how technology is affecting migrants at the border um uh human rights and technology so these these kinds of uh these kinds of issues so the syllabus is online you can if, if you go to my webpage, you can just get to the um you can you can get to the course uh but there's no videos because it's like a discussion-based class it's not like a lecture-based course uh there's also um Glencora Bordal at um uh at Oregon uh teaches uh, a great course as well. Again, there's no videos, so it's not. Uh, but it, there's uh, a great syllabus as well, and I can send I can send this information out mm -hmm. later. Um, and uh, Mihir Balare is also teaching a class. I think uh, he taught it last year um, on these topics. If you go to his webpage, you can find that. And um, I know Phil Rogaway had a class scheduled on these topics, um, I don't know, it, he, he had to, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, you know, it didn't, he didn't go through with it, but he, maybe he's doing it, he's doing it now. Um, he also wrote a great letter, a really interesting letter to his students that were registered for the class. Um, I think it's on his webpage, I would recommend reading it as well. I remember reading it and thinking it was, it was, it was very interesting. Um, Just to add to that, so like I said before, um, Ian Goldberg and, uh, uh, and Jen Whitson here at University of Waterloo had a course on uh, surveillance and privacy, and I, I believe they would run it again at some point. Uh, but but there is clearly like a, you know, undergrad level courses that touches on this are uh, uh, in, in CBA short supply. Uh, yeah. There's one more question. I think you can take one more. Um, uh, the question is: I'm interested in the culture of computer science departments. Uh, what additional changes do you think would uh, help support the support socially responsible work you look at? For ex uh, from, from what you said, uh, 12 months salary would be helpful. Uh, noticing social justice branding schemes like another, seems like another important change. Uh, are there other changes in our computer science departments that you would like to see? Um, so generally yeah. about incentives. Uh, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one issue is funding. Um, because we're so dependent on funding, in, at least in the US. I, I mean, I know Canada has a slightly different funding structure, so maybe it's not as, as bad as it is in the US, but in the US, we're really dependent on funding. In, and in so Canada, that, faculty members do get paid for the entire year. Yeah, so at, least, right, right, so at least there's that. Um, and so that is going to determine, you know, a lot of people's research agendas is where they can get funding from. There's just, you know, and in particular, if you're, trying to work on problems of marginalized communities, you know, who aren't the ones with the funding, then, you know, their, their problems are not going to be um, addressed. So, so funding is definitely one thing. Um, you know, I, 
I do think we need to change our culture and CS as a whole. I, I think we need to change how we think of education and what we, how we think of computer science, right? We need to move away from this kind of, uh, you know, this like arts, this sort of machine based and purely technical thing. Like CS is that, but it's also other things as well. And we need to have a broader mindset when it comes to CS education, I think. So that's the big thing that I would really wanna see. Um, but that is going to take quite some time um, and some effort, you know, each department is going to have to really work or, or think about whether, you know, they want to go this route. I think eventually they all will realize that it's the right thing to do, but it's going to take some time for each department to really integrate these things. And it takes a lot of work and it takes a, a lot of dedication. Like we've been working on it at Brown and we're, you know, we still have a really long way to go. It's not, it's not easy at all. So. Thank you. Um, so Jen Ritson posted a link to a, a, a crisp talk uh, last fall and a textbook, an open source textbook that relates to the topics. So I'll, I'll make that visible to everybody. Um, so just before we close, there's one more question. Do data scientists get the opportunity to discuss and contribute to the formation of ethical technology? And uh, I'm currently in high school, so I'm curious whether being a computer science or data, uh, or data science student will give me more opportunity to dive into this topic. So I think this is also an important aspect of uh, uh, ethical uh, yeah. and ethical aspect. So perhaps you can. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. So I think data science, um, I, in, in some way, you know, so data science and CS are very related, right? Obviously it's like, there's a huge intersection. Um, I think, I, but I'm not sure, I, I, my impression is that, um, these issues are like, I think data science realized early on in its, um, in its evolution that it was impacting people directly, right? Uh, it's a newer field, obviously, like it's, it's a much more recent field. Um, and there were, you know, and there's been like, and it's sort of, um, I think, clear to data scientists that the decisions that or the insights that they're going to get from data are to be applied right to policy and to, to impacting people's lives so that realization i think has been there whereas in computer science because computer science evolved from like you know i mean since like the 60s and etc right where this wasn't the case it's been slower we've been slower to kind of realize this right like in at least explicitly um so in data science, you probably have more discussions about this, about these issues, um, I would think. But uh, the thing with data science also is that there's also been, you know, there's been a lot of really questionable data science work uh, with respect to, you know, in terms of negative outcomes and harms, right? Like, and especially if you look at kind of the machine learning, the more machine learning parts, um, you know, so things like, you, you know, using um, machine learning algorithms, right, to make decisions about people's freedom, right, um, uh, or using data science for surveillance or all of these things. So, uh, so I think there's probably more discussion. Um, but again, that's also because there's probably, there's been a lot of direct harms that I think have been more obvious as well. So, so I think we come to the uh, end of the time. Thank you very much, uh, Sunny. We appreciate your time. And I think uh, you, you were able to engage with the audience uh, right till the end. Um, so one thing I want to also point out to the audience is that uh, our institute, Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute, is, uh, is, is broad-based. It uh, cuts across all the academic units on campus and uh, uh, consists of not only engineers and mathematicians and computer scientists, but also social scientists and political scientists and so on. So the next talk, uh, uh, CPA talk uh, on the 8th of June, Wednesday 8th of June, is actually by two of our political scientists who are part of the Institute. Um, and, uh, and, and that's another way for the audience to you know, um, be exposed to different aspects of cybersecurity and privacy uh, seen through different lenses. Um, so uh, they'll watch out for announcements in, in our webpage, cpi.t1.ca. And uh, when, when uh, we have more details and announce the title and the abstract and so on, uh, please register and attend. Um, uh, there's a, a question asking, uh, can Semi send his, uh, send his, send his email here? Um, uh, <laughs> if you like, we can do that. Otherwise, uh, when we make the announcement, I'll include a link to Semi's uh, uh, homepage when we announce the the video recording. 
And from there, you can find all the information and also how to contact him. Sounds good. Thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.